when Jesse did the altar call that night of just, if there's anything in your life that you feel like you've held back from God, if there's anywhere in your life that you feel like you haven't fully surrendered, I, I, I just... I plead with you, like, come forward, repent, and receive prayer, and get baptized. I don't know how many people went up. A lot of people went up to the front, and I remember I was sitting in the back with a couple of my buddies because we were kind of doing security detail and different things like that, and just watching all these people coming forward, grown men crying, like, under genuine conviction from the Holy Spirit that, like, they hadn't given Him everything. Um, and for me, that was that was one of the craziest miracles I've ever seen. Like a guy could have stood up out of a wheelchair and that would have been amazing. But seeing that many people actually understand what it meant in that moment to give God everything. My actual first exposure to Saturate like events was at the beach in 2020. And it was right after COVID um, had just hit. All these churches shut down. The church I was at actually decided to stop meeting in the building. We started meeting in a park. Um, but, uh, you know, it was just a very interesting time in general. And obviously they told me about what was going on in the beaches. And so I remember the first time I showed up on one of those Friday nights and literally it, it was probably like fourth or fifth week. It, it had already been going for a little bit and no joke. I mean, a thousand plus people on the beach easily. And I had no idea what I was walking up to in my head. I was like, oh, like I'm going to like one of my friends, like worship nights or something like that, you know, um, and no one will probably show up because COVID and everything else. And I showed up and instantly I was really, uh, you could feel the presence of God. Um, it was something different. There was like a raw authenticity of it, of just a bunch of people gathered. Uh, Jesse was speaking on a megaphone. Um, there was a guy leading worship on a guitar uh, and people just singing. And actually, one uh, at that point, the speaker we were using wasn't working anymore. And so no one was leading like uh, worship through a microphone. They were actually like just using their voice. But everybody else started singing along with them. Um, and I remember Jesse actually at one point went into the middle of this huge circle of people and the people on the outside of the circles like all the way towards the back, because that's where I was. We couldn't actually even hear what she was saying. Um, and even though people weren't hearing what she was saying, God was moving so powerfully that he was touching people still. Um, and that really, that really impacted me in the sense that I was like, wow, something's really going on here. Um, and then they start doing baptisms and just literally as far as you can see down the beach, you see people just getting baptized people worshiping sporadically all throughout the beach, and then people just talking to random people walking down the boardwalk uh, about Jesus. You know, someone gets out of the water from surfing and someone walks up to him and starts telling him about Jesus and the dude gets saved and gets back in the water to get baptized. Like it just was, it, it was, I've never seen anything like that in my life. Uh, you know, I've been in ministry at that point for about four years. I was working with uh, a ministry called Young Life, working with kids in foster care, uh, leading them to Jesus and working with a lot of kids and gangs and things like that and, and got to see really amazing stuff. But there was something different about the beach that day. Um, and it did. It, it, it really did like mark me. I'm not even sure exactly what it did, but I think it maybe just showed me what was possible, that there was more. Um, and at that time, um, I was in transition leaving uh, the, the church that I was at, and I had actually decided to be a part of the salt house churches that were going on in California. Um, and it was actually a really cool time because we had probably like three or four new church plants start as a result of what happened on the beaches. There were so many people that were like, man, I just had this crazy experience with God. Now I need like a family and I want to get discipled and I want to grow. And so as a result, some of our house churches grew which was, was really neat. And so I got to be a part of one of the house churches in Costa Mesa. Um, and as a result of that, I started getting to be around Parker and Jesse and them a little bit more. They, they asked me to start helping out with Saturate a little bit. And we began planning a, another revival that was going to be in December of 2020. And we did in San Juan Capistrano um, and set up this big, big tent. It was the first time any of us had set up a tent like that. Uh, Mario Murillo actually was kind enough to let us use his tent. Um, and he was had a, some of his team that was going to come help. All of them couldn't show up. So a bunch of the guys 
uh, that I was in church with went down there and we were trying to figure out how to put up this tent. And it was, it was a bit of a, a, a mess, but we got it up. And again, we didn't have any idea if anyone was even going to show up or not. We just kind of in faith were like, all right, we're going to set up this thousand person tent and uh, pray that people show up. And we just know that we're going to preach the gospel and, and uh, give people an opportunity to repent and see what happens. And um, that tent revival actually went for, for three days. And that was, a, that was really probably my first real dose of like seeing the Holy Spirit move. And um, I'd gotten to see some things. I'd seen some people healed. I'd seen some prophecy. Um, but I still was getting used to just the fact that the Holy Spirit could really do whatever he wanted to do. And I was hungry and excited to see more miracles. But I think what happened at the tent that caught me off guard, it was, it was less seeing a bunch of miracles, even though we did. But what I saw was for the first time, a genuine um, like corporate repentance. I'd never seen anything quite like that before, um, especially the night where Jesse, you know, felt led to give away her Jeep. Um, you know, the Lord had impressed on her that she needed to give away her Jeep Wrangler. It was a brand new Jeep that someone had gifted to her. And uh, she felt Lord led to, to give that away. Um, and the call was like, there's nothing off the table for you, God. Like, I'll give you everything and anything in my life. You can have it. Like, the call was to go all in. And uh, that night at the tent, you know, it's hard to say how many people were actually there. At least a few hundred. It was, it was a good number of people. And for California, I remember it was like 30-something degrees outside. Everybody had their jackets on. It was freezing cold because in California, we don't have any tolerance for that. But uh, anyways, uh, when Jesse did the altar call that night of just, if there's anything in your life that you feel like you've held back from God, if there's anywhere in your life that you feel like you haven't fully surrendered, I, I, I just... I plead with you, like, come forward, repent, and receive prayer, and get baptized. I don't know how many people went up. A lot of people went up to the front, and I remember I was sitting in the back with a couple of my buddies because we were kind of doing security detail and different things like that, and just watching all these people coming forward, grown men crying, like, under genuine conviction from the Holy Spirit that, like, they hadn't given Him everything. Um and for me, that was that was one of the craziest miracles I've ever seen. Like a guy could have stood up out of a wheelchair and that would have been amazing. But seeing that many people actually understand what it meant in that moment to give God everything, like that they hadn't actually counted the cost of following Jesus, that they had fallen into kind of a consumer Christianity, like comfort level in their own life where it required no sacrifice for themselves. Like there was this honest genuine repentance and it was so cool and then to be able to start ministering to people and what god began to do was taking this repentant heart and showing them that what they're giving up what they're willing to surrender a lot of them put things down on the altar whether it was car keys or money or whatever like prophetic acts of like things they need to give up cigarettes you name it and in return, what they were getting was God giving them, I think, revelation for like the pearl of great price. That like, when you give me everything, when you surrender everything to me, you actually get everything in return because you're getting me. You're making more space in yourself to actually have more of me, which is is the greatest gift that there is. Um, and that was just so cool to see during the tent, like that exchange really take place and you know after the altar call and people began uh, to get prayed for we did a call to baptisms and the water was freezing like like legitimately like 30 degrees um, it was cold and we had a handful of towels because again we didn't know what God was going to do and we weren't, weren't prepared for it but we baptized for probably about two hours uh, that night and people were freezing cold people were taking off their jackets to give it to people who had been getting baptized and again you were just seeing people just get completely broken um i don't it, it was deliverance taking place like people getting released of strongholds and things that had held them back from from going to the lord and it was just it was it was just phenomenal and i know for me personally i was i was all in for the lord but that showed me, okay, there's even more that even for myself, like when I think that I'm like, oh, I've sold everything, 
I have full-time ministry. Like I'll do whatever you ask me to do, God, that there's actually even more. There's always more, which is one of the coolest things about God, right? Um, but for for myself, it definitely marked me and like, all right, this is this is what it's all about. Like getting to see people go all in and have a genuine encounter with God that actually changes the trajectory of their life. Um, and I think the Lord really was very gracious to even show us as a ministry saturate that like, hey, this is a huge piece of what I'm actually calling you to. I, I don't know if any of us had the actual language for it at this point. Um, you know, I certainly didn't anyways, but I think one of the calls of the ministry and that we've seen carried on throughout the last couple of years is like a call to repentance and a call to go all in for the Lord, like holding nothing back. Um, and so it just was a really, really sweet time. And just like some of my most fond memories of just getting to see God move. <laughs> Every time we've ever done anything, there's resistance, right? And the enemy wants to make it seem like it's harder than it really is. But we've learned to know that the more resistance generally, that's because the more that God's about to do. So we actually get excited about it. But at the tent, um, comparatively, I guess it went fairly smooth. Um, but I mean, it also was our first time ever doing a tent revival. So even just like trying to get the tent up was like a mess. And, you know, there was a handful of people that were supposed to come and be a part of it to do ministry time and preach and different things that just didn't. Um, and so a lot of the plans that we had fell through. Um, and we kind of had to improvise, which again, I guess actually reflecting on it is like a great learning lesson because that's a huge trademark of what God's had us do now is like you, you set up a structure and you have a plan and it's really good because I think God honors us trying to plan and, and do things in excellence. But then I think he also really likes it when we're willing to move and, and pivot based on what he's doing in the moment. And so um, there was a lot of that happening for sure. I mean, even just little things like a check-in system, like trying to figure out how to like manage hundreds of people coming at one time. We just didn't have like the systems in place to do that super well. Um, but in God's grace, like it all, it all worked out. Um, I, I do believe there was, uh, you know, some of the neighbors who called the police and told them, you know, that we were gathering and they told us that if we went up certain, above a certain decimal of sound, they'd shut us down. And, you know, we certainly had cops telling us they were going to, going to shut us down, but it never, it never came to fruition. I guess my advice for anyone that wants to start revival or see revival happen in their region would really be, um, it's got to start with you. Um, you know, I think revival sometimes can be a word that's over spiritualized. Um, and, People maybe don't even know what that means, but they use it. And revival really is calling us back to what God originally intended. You know, it's 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 what Jesus said when he came. He's like, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Like, I think revival is just a calling back to what God intended for us to do, which is live completely surrendered to him. And so um, I think if you want to see revival come in your city or your region or even in your school or your home, uh, it's got to start with you. And it starts with an honest conversation with the Lord of like, God, what what am I holding back from you? Is there anything that I need to repent of? Um, and it's not a one-time repentance. It's constant. Because if you want to continue to grow in the Lord, then the standard he's going to call you to is going to continue to go up. And you're going to continue to have a grace to meet that standard. But you have to continually lay things down. Um, and that's where revival sparks from, is from a genuinely humble and contrite heart and repentant heart that's reverent for the Lord because you know what he's done for you. And when he gets a hold of you in that way and you give him your heart in that way, it, it it's contagious. People that are around you will want what you have, but the, the trick is you have to actually be carrying it. Um, and then also just praying and asking the Lord what you're supposed to do. So um, it's great to get resources um, to, to figure out, okay, how do I lead revival? And, and uh, hopefully this video is helpful, but also it's never going to be a program. There's never going to be a, a one, two, three step to seeing it happen. It's going to be, God, what are you asking me to do and be willing to do it? He may be calling you to pray and intercede for months at a time and, and you don't see anything. You're just praying and being faithful. He may ask you to go out to your your local neighborhood or coffee shop and just share the gospel every single day. And you may not see anybody get saved, but he's doing something in you. And I think if you're willing to be obedient to what he's doing and asking you to do, then he begins to trust you with more and more and more and more. And I think that's how you actually see genuine revival on a larger scale, because I think we all can experience revival in ourselves. But 
We want to start seeing that impact others and and even be able to lead revival. Um, you've got to be faithful with what you've you've been given. Um, and honestly, leading revival is not some like glorious like oh man, so much fun. It is so much fun. It's amazing, but also it's a big responsibility. It's not it's not a joke. It's something that's really serious. Um, and I think the Lord takes really seriously. And there's a balance of like enjoying it and loving it and being so grateful for it, but also like continuing to stay reverent and knowing that like it's God doing it, not yourself. And so there's a lot of pitfalls that can come with that. And so I think you're going to have to build up your character and let the Lord build up your character. Um, and I know even for myself, he's constantly rebuking me and being like, you know, little things that I'm doing. He's like, see, you're, you're kind of taking credit for that. Or, oh, see, you kind of think that that's you. Um, and every time that that happens, he's, he's faithful to, to show me and, and the, give me an opportunity to repent. And so I think that'd probably be, be my, my advice in simple terms, just repent daily and often and, and just keep asking the Lord what you're supposed to do and then be obedient to it. Get alone with the Lord in this season. Um, get into the secret place to actually let him refine you and build you up and, and honestly show you what he did for you on the cross, that like you're saved, um, that he's given you this gift. And beyond that, he's also your father who provides for you day in and day out that you get to have this intimate relationship with. And let, I think this can be misused sometimes, but like let the love of the father compel you. Like what Paul talks about in Corinthians, like that that love that you receive from him every single day actually compels everything that you do. Um, because it just will make your life a whole lot easier rather than trying to strive for something um, that's not flowing out of you. And the only way to get it to flow out of you is by spending time with them. So get alone with them and you'll figure out what, what you need to be doing.